National Pie Day. So, National Pie Day here in the USA. Do I mean apple or cherry or possibly pecan? Or am I talking about the mathematical constant? Mm hmm. I'm not telling. But one thing I will tell you is the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, the Daily Dope is in the air, and I am Jeff McAleer, your host, as well as the Grand Poobah of TheGamingGang.com. So yes, today is Pi Day, National Pi Day, which I believe, what was it, about 30 years ago? The U.S. government decided, okay, we're making it National Pi Day, P.I. Day, and I found it very unusual that Stephen Hawking passed away on Pi Day. Now, I got this news uh, that Stephen Hawking had passed away last night. I was, I was, actually, um, I was actually watching news. I was, I was engrossed by that whole special election in Pennsylvania, how neck and neck it was. And once again, don't be one of these people who thinks your vote doesn't count, because as you can see in that election, every vote's going to count. But uh, I, I saw the news break and I was like, oh, no, because really one of the most spectacular minds of the 20th and 21st century has now gone off into the great unknown in the universe, the, one of the great mysteries of the universe. So I was very, very sad to hear the news of Stephen Hawking passing away at the age of 76. Anyway. Welcome aboard. It is War Game Wednesday. Today is March 14th, and I am streaming live. Chat is available on YouTube as well as Twitter. So it's just not on screen. I point this out every show. It's one of the ways that I keep uh, some of the derogatory or bizarre comments from popping up. But if you want to chime in, I got an unboxing I'm going to take care of today. But uh, if you wanted to say hello or when I'm unboxing the new GMT expansion that I'm going to take a peek at, want to see something closer up or have a question, feel free. Chime in. I will definitely point out who it is, what you're asking, and uh, give you a reply or show something up. Anyway, as I mentioned, today is War Game Wednesday. I like to feature War Games on Wednesday. So today I will be unboxing main battle tank FRG from GMT Games. This brings uh, many of the Western, Ger or I should say West German units to the hypothetical 1987 World War III clash in Germany, in Europe. So I'll be taking a look at that in just a bit. I've got plenty of news. I do have a bit of an opinion piece I'm going to share today, which is really focused on war gamers and our hobby. So just want to mention that as well. So let's jump into the news. I actually even have some war gaming news today. How about that? Usually on Wednesday, I don't run across anything cool to point out on a Wednesday to share with the war gamers who are watching out there. Uh, before I jump into the news, I should point out this is episode 66 of The Daily Dope. So I guess I should sing, get your kicks in episode 66. Boom, 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 boom. And of course, you can mm, set that to whatever music from whatever version of <laughs> that song you want. <clears throat> anyway, let me grab a sip here. Yeah, it's a little chilly down in the uh, duct tape studios again today. And it's always dry. And there's always little cat hairs floating around that maybe you don't see, but I catch them. All right. Anyway, moving into the news. The popular campaign setting Midgard from Cobol Press has a new source book that's available right now for 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons. And I've got the dope on the Midgard Heroes Handbook. 
The flame of heroes must light a dark world. Welcome to a world of dark roads and deep magic, where you can match wits with Baba Yaga, set sail for uncharted islands with Minotaur Corsairs, and face the fury of the giants in the icy north. Why is it that the ice giants always live in the north? Isn't there a south pole on any of these worlds just as cold? <laughs> the Midgard Heroes Handbook is for 5th edition and has everything you need to create a character for a 5th edition Midgard campaign. It includes full details on 11 new races and 4 variants on standard races. Roll up a Trollkin Barbarian, a Raven Folk Fighter, or a Kobold Rogue, and more. You will also get more than 48 new class options, including Bard Colleges and Paladin Oaths, Martial Ranger and Rogue Archetypes, and new weapon and gear, a new Druid Circle, and a dozen new Cleric Domains, including Beer? It says Beer. I am not misreading that. It does say Beer, Justice, and Moon Domains. So obviously, I would be a beer cleric in Midgard. That goes without saying. Also includes Sorceress Bloodlines, new Warlock packs, and Strange Arcane Traditions, 20 backgrounds from the Southlands to the distant north, and nearly 300 new spells from the fan-favorite Deep Magic series, including Shadow Magic, Clockwork Magic, Battle Magic, Rune Magic, and more. The Shadow Roads are open, and the World Serpent stirs in its sleep. Adventure awaits the bold. The 216-page supplement is available in print, as well as PDF, it's a combo, from Cobalt Press for $39.99, or in PDF over at our friends at Drive Thru RPG for $24.99. I will point out, uh, as I do with all Drive Thru RPG mentions, if you do dig PDFs for your RPG core books, supplements, adventures, what have you, be sure to swing by thegamegang.com first, click on one of our banners for the drive through sites, and if you happen to make a purchase, we get a small portion of that sale. Anyway, and uh, Cobalt Press does really nice stuff. I have really, I've never really gotten into uh, any of like their campaign settings or... Uh, some of their supplemental materials, but I have read their world building books and they're really, really well done. So, and I have talked about their monster codex and things like that. I should really start trying to take a look at more Cobalt Press stuff. All right, so jumping off of the news, uh, Robert Moffat's chiming in saying, Hey, Jeff, howdy, Rob, how are you? Yes, beer is good. Yes, Rob's saying beer is good and... I will give him the thumbs up with that, too. I'm a Guinness drinker, personally. If I'm not drinking Guinness, then I just drink cheapo lagers. Because I figure, what's the point of spending $30 on a 24-pack on a of, say, Budweiser, when I can get basically the same exact beer for, for like $9.99 for a 24-pack? Yeah, yeah, I'll drink cheap beer. But uh, I prefer... I prefer stouts. I prefer Guinness. Guinness is good for you. Oh, wait, I'm not allowed to say that here in the U.S. Can't uh, can't promote any sort of medicinal benefits of any alcoholic beverage here in the U.S. But over across the pond, you'll see signs everywhere saying Guinness is good for you. All right, moving right along. USAopoly has announced an upcoming game based on Adult Swim's Samurai Jack. Hmm... And it's scheduled for this summer. And I have the dope. Based on the fifth and final season of the animated series Samurai Jack, Back to the Past picks up the title character's mission to return to the era before the reign of his adversary, the evil demon Aku. Jack's friends accompany him along a path comprised of various locations from the series to defeat villains and finish with the most honor. Winning requires utilizing allies, traits, and weapons while guarding Jack's sanity. Yes, sanity is important. Taking players on an unpredictable ride that mirrors the story-rich episodes revered by critics and loved by fans. Samurai Jack Back to the Past features custom-sculpted figures for Jack, Aku, 
Ashi, and more characters from the series. The game is for two to five players, ages 13 and up, and plays in around 45 to 60 minutes. The MSRP, when this arrives, and I do not have an exact date, I just know it's a summer release, but the MSRP will be $34.95. All right, so uh, this looks kind of neat. I like the sculpts for the figures, and I'm guessing they're going to be pre-paints. So they look pretty cool. I'll be honest, I've never actually watched Samurai Jack. I've heard it's a good show. All right, okay, between us, I just recently binge-watched the three seasons of Rick and Morty. Recently. I hadn't seen the show before. It's a riot. <laughs> it is now... I, I think I saw a couple of episodes over the years, but I never sat down and watched the whole thing. It is a riot. It is, it's really, really funny. And I can see why some of those cryptozoic games take particular episodes and <laughs> make games from them. So this looks pretty interesting from uh, USAopoly. And uh, it's nice to see Adult Swim actually is one of their properties going to a company that's not cryptozoic. No offense, cryptozoic. I'm just saying, it's nice to see them spread some love. Okay, so I mentioned when I opened the show, I actually have some wargaming news. I know, on a Wednesday, it never seems to be available on Wednesdays. It's always other days of the week. But I've actually got two news pieces, and I will grab a quick sip here. And Rob says, kind of partial to Great Lakes Brewery myself, Edmund Fitzgerald Cream Stout. Damn good brew. Trying to think if I've ever had that one. I don't think so. I don't think I've had the Edmund Fitzgerald. And no, I am not going to bust out into the Gordon Lightfoot song. Don't worry. Actually, I dig that song. <laughs> I really do. All right, so let's get into some war gaming news because the second title of the War of 1812 campaign series trilogy is up for, oh, wait, I am in the wrong order here. Hold on. Uh, hang on, let's jump. Huh, I could have swore that I had this set up right. Well, that's what happens when I have all of, uh, I don't know, I think I, I got downstairs, started turning on all the equipment here in the duct tape studios at about uh, 10 minutes before the show started. And I'll explain why in a minute, because I ran across something that kind of ticked me off a little bit. Um, and that's the uh, little kind of opinion piece that I'm going to talk about. Now I have to go and track this down. Okay, so as I was saying, the second title in the War of 1812 campaign series trilogy is up for crowdfunding from Worthington Publishing and I do have the dope about it. It is late 1814 and peace commissioners are looking for an advantage to end the War of 1812 on the best terms. British leadership chooses Pensacola, Mobile, and New Orleans as a place to occupy to impose its terms and maybe annex the Southern United States. Plush, uh, plush, duh, plus British naval commanders had set their sights on New Orleans, or New Orleans, I prefer to say New Orleans, bustling warehouses as ripe prizes. Detaching veteran divisions from Wellington's army, which was fighting in Europe, Britain sends its best against the backwoodsmen defending the American Gulf Coast. Led by Wellington's chief of staff and brother-in-law, General Sir Edmund Par uh, Packenham, Packenham? They attack Mobile and occupy Pensacola in an effort to bring Indian and Spanish support for the main effort against New Orleans. General Andrew Jackson counters the British moves by quickly reinforcing the forts defending Mobile and boldly attacking the Spanish and British forces in Pensacola. The British, using their navy to navigate the bayous, landed the swamps eight miles behind New Orleans in a brilliant surprise move. Well, it didn't turn out to be all that brilliant in the end because General Jackson attacks them immediately, countering the surprise. Both sides entrench and bring in reinforcements to begin the famous Battle of New Orleans. 
And uh, no, I will not bust out into that song either. Anyway, but now with this Kickstarter, you are in command in War Along the Gulf Coast. War Along the Gulf Coast allows gamers to refight Andrew Jackson's campaign against British General Packenham's... It is Packenham, isn't it? I'm not super up on the War of 1812. I know a bit, but still. Anyway, against the British invas invaders, the game uses the proven blue and gray combat system where morale is as important as the number of soldiers. You are limited in how many units you may move based on the number of action points you receive, plus a random number of action points based on your commander. This means no two games will play alike. Movement is location to location. When the two armies end a move in the same location, a battle occurs and the action moves to the battle board. War along the golf course... <sighs> told you, it's super dry in here. All right. War along the Gulf Coast, not Gulf Coast. Yes, they're invading this golf course. We'll be limited to 250 copies. The project is already fully funded, and you can reserve a copy of the game at the $85 pledge level. This Kickstarter will run through March 24th. I have to admit, I have never actually played any of the Worthington titles. I think they follow me on Twitter, to be honest. But no, I've, I've never gotten to check anything out. But I can see that this is one of those block fog of war games, obviously enough. Uh, and uh, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of the Columbia games, which I've been able to play, which have that same fog of war element. I played the, uh, the Stonewall Jackson game. And I also played Julius Caesar and uh, really dug it. I, I, I remember back in the day, I played uh, Bobby Lee and I want to say the other title is, is it just called U.S. Grant? I played those at Gen Con, amazingly enough, and uh, really enjoyed those. Anyway, so yeah, definitely check this out. This looks pretty good and it is not going to be available in large numbers now, I will point out, when I took a peek at it this morning, there are about 50 backers, and they have met their, their goal, their funding goal. So uh, Worthington will cut it off at 250 copies. So you've got, uh, you've got the ability to get in there. It's not like, you know, well, it, they've got 249 backers. So definitely check this out. Anyway, I was just talking about uh, Bobby Lee and Sam. Oh, it's Sam Grant. That's what it was, Sam Grant. Anyway, uh, speaking of that, there is a new American Civil War title, which is arriving from Hollandspiel. And uh, this is what I started showing you off a minute ago. I've got the dope on Hood's Last Gamble, 1864. After some maneuvering in Northern Georgia in an attempt to disrupt Sherman's supply line, John Bell Hood moved the Confederate Army of Tennessee westward and then to the north. George Thomas's Army of the Cumberland, which was dispersed but growing, stood in the way. Hood's plan had objectives such as defeating scattered Union armies, bringing in thousands of recruits from Tennessee, taking the city of Nashville, and after that, even moving into Kentucky and beyond. These goals were optimistic in the face of federal strength, but Hood was determined to gamble. Yes, because John Bell Hood was a uh, serious gambler when it came to the battlefield, that's for sure. Hood's Last Gamble is an operational level game for two players exploring the 1864 Franklin Nashville campaign. It shares some similarities with the designer's earlier games, More Aggressive Attitudes and Objective Shreveport, but it has its own identity and flavor. This one has a larger map with many tricky terrain challenges and more special event cards around which to build your strategy. It utilizes a streamlined approach to the tracking of unit strength points that reduces counter clutter and allows for more elegant hidden movement opportunities. Supply counters are crucial to getting the most out of your units and with winter just around the corner, the Confederate player must act quickly and decisively 
in order to change history. Don't see that happen. Don't know. Could's last gamble is for two players, plays in around two hours, and carries an MSRP of $40. That sounds like a pretty good deal. You can order it right now at the Holland Spiel website. Cool. Uh, Holland Spiel reminds me a little bit of... Um, eh, kind, of a, kind of a mix of like Tiny Battle Publishing and Flying Pig Games. They kind of fall in between. And I believe the folks over at uh, Holland Spiel are really good friends with uh, Mark H. Walker. So if they're buddies with Mark, they should be pretty cool people. And forty dollars for a war game that seems pretty unique. And I like the I like the element where they're basically showing that there are like event cards that you can utilize. So I like a little bit of that random chaos added into the mix. And it looks as if you might actually have uh, a separate sheet that you're tracking the strength of the armies in that because it doesn't look like there's just the typical army strength uh, markings on the counters. Excuse me, sorry. Plus, hey, come on. Let's go battle, go head to head against the Rock of Chickamauga. How can you pass up on that, right? All right, so Robert Moffat uh, pops in says, those black games by Columbia and these by Worthington are great beer and pretzel games, very accessible for non-war gamers. Yeah, perfect, perfectly pointed out. I completely agree. Uh, I played Julius Caesar from Columbia with some folks who were not traditional hex encounter war gamers and they really dug it yeah i i like the the block system the fog of war and yes uh, uh i don't know if i'd say beer and pretzels to me beer and pretzels are like really light kind of games like really old school ziploc bag uh steve jackson kind of war games kind of strike me as beer and pretzel but yeah i can see where where rob's coming from all right so my final news piece a trio of new Robotech board games are coming soon through a team-up between Japanime Games, Strange Machine Games, Escape Velocity Games, and Harmony Gold. There are three that have already been announced. There is Ace Pilot, Attack on the SDF-1. Uh, I'm sorry, there's Ace Pilot, Attack on the SDF-1, and Brace for Impact. Strange Machine Games and Escape Velocity Games have partnered up and they are excited to announce worldwide distribution of three new Robotech titles through Japanime Games, and these will begin in June of 2018. Each of these titles requires a different set of skills in order to take down the invading Zentradi forces. Robotech Ace Pilot is a competitive dice game for two to four players in which they will vie for the esteemed title of Ace Pilot. Each turn, players must evaluate the enemy threat, then attempt to recruit the best SDF-1 crew member for the job, collecting their kills as they succeed. Along the way, players gather... Oh, hey, I'm not even uh, on the right news piece. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, that's what happens when I had the news pieces in the wrong order. <clears throat> we we uh, forgot to change over to the other slide. Actually, uh, don't be too concerned with this, folks, because I'm going to rain on the Robotech parade here in just a moment. Anyway, along the way, players gather key upgrades and thwart their friends in an attempt to gain the title of Ace Pilot. Robotech Ace Pilot is recommended for ages 8 and up. Playtime takes about 25 minutes. Estimated release is June. No MSRP info. Uh, info. Robotech Attack on the SDF-1 is a cooperative board game for one to five players who each take on the role of a heroic character from the venerable Super Dimension Fortress 1. I thought it was super dimensional. Maybe I'm wrong. Also known as the SDF-1. It is the player's duty to defend the SDF-1 against continuous waves of Zentradi attacks, unexpected disasters, and treachery. As heroes, players will be forced to battle vicious enemies, repair damage, and manage resources. Tough decisions and sacrifices will be required for players to complete their objectives and reach home safely. 
Attack on the SDF-1 is a great addition to Game, Light, Game Night or to play solo. It's according to Japanime Games. Robotech Attack on the SDF-1 is recommended for ages 12 and up, and playtime takes about two hours per scenario. The estimated release on this is August. Then there's Robotech Brace for Impact, and it's a real-time cooperative game for 2 to 10 players, and it's from Escape Velocity Games. Players must work together as the officers aboard the SDF-1, while one player takes on the role of the dreaded Zentradi, assaulting the other players. Players each have a hand of cards representing problems that need to be solved. However, they must work with at least one other crew member to complete their actions. The timer is ticking and players must begin to fix their ship and return fire immediately. At the same time, the Zentradi player will be using tactics cards from their hand, attacking with their fleet and trying to take down the SDF-1. Can you survive the final 10 minutes of this intense firefight and save humanity? Robotech Brace for Impact is recommended for ages 10 and up, playtime is about 10 minutes, and the estimated release is summer of 2018. All right, so I said I was going to rain on your Robotech parade, right? So I have to point out uh, Dave over at Solar Flare Games has uh, been working on Robotech Force of Arms for quite some time. In fact, it's coming out in June. It's supposed to be out in June. And distribution deals, everything's already set up for the game. And I'm not going to rehash the whole Palladium... Robotech Kickstarter, Robotech Tactics Kickstarter disaster. But when I was talking about that on the other show, I mentioned that Harmony Gold is a dumpster fire in itself, too. Really are. Take a look online and you will find that uh, it is just managed by idiots. Let's, I'll be very honest. It's managed by idiots. It's how it works. Carl Masick is passed on to the great beyond, so... Whoever's wrong, I mean, not like he ran the company all that well either. But what's going on here is it looks like Harmony Gold is going to take any opportunity they possibly can to grab as much cash as they can before they lose their rights to Robotech in 2020. So that is coming pretty soon. And it wasn't that long ago that Harmony Gold pulled their licensing away from Palladium books. So one has the impression that these games have kind of been thrown together to try to come out this summer. Now, as I mentioned, Solar Flare Games, their Robotech Force of Arms has nothing to do with Japanime games. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. These three other titles do. And I was doing a little research behind the scenes because the first thing I, I know, Dave, I have worked with Dave on various different Kickstarters that he's had. So, like Nightmare Forest. Really fun, uh, push-your-luck dice game. And uh, so, anyway, so... I'm selling with Lords of Rock. I mean, there's a few games. You can see I've done reviews and done previews for Solar Flare and, and Dave in the past. So, the first thing I noticed, I was like, what the hell's going on here? I know his Robotech game is coming out in June. Now, suddenly... Japanime Games announces at least three Robotech games that they've partnered up with Harmony Gold and these other game companies. Something smells fishy. So as I was going to say, so I poke around a little bit behind the scenes and Escape Velocity Games, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know anything about them. I don't think they really have much out. The other game company, though, and you know what? Off the top of my head, I forgot what it was. <laughs> Let me jump back here and take a look. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can... Eh, whatever. Whatever. I forget what it's called, what the other company was called. Uh, but I took a look at some of their games and uh, just to kind of get a feel for what people think of them on Board Game Geek. They're not exactly well known for putting out uh, very good games. And of course... Japanime games, most of their titles everybody knows is crap anyway. So, yes, there's three new titles for Robotech, and I will take a step... Well, there's four. I'm not tossing in Solar Flare's <laughs> title 
Robotech Force of Arms into this mix. Because I'm sure it's going to be pretty cool. I've seen some some uh, prototype stuff for it. Not a lot, but seen a little bit. But I get the impression that these three titles are going to be steaming piles. And they are simply cash grabs. That's just my gut impression. That's all I'm saying. I could be very wrong. They could be fantastic games. But I doubt it. All right, so that is the news of the day. So I uh, I wanted to point out, and and this is really this is something that's really directed at war gamers. And I and, and I'll be very honest. What I have to say is probably gonna piss people off, and uh, it it'll probably cost me some subscribers and followers on Twitter and people who go to the gaming gang and so on and so forth. But you know what? I don't care. It's something that needs to be addressed. So anyway, so earlier this morning, people who follow the Daily Dope know that I spend my mornings, usually I'll have emails for news pieces, and there were actually two big news items today that I did not include in today, I'm not including in today's show. I'll, I'll take care of those tomorrow. I wanted to, I wanted to share more Wargaming news. So anyway, so I'm, I'm peeking around, so I find myself clicking on an article at BehindTheHex.com. And the article was entitled something along the lines of how to bring more women to war game or war game hobby or war gaming hobby. What, uh, the grammar wasn't real good, but I, I do believe that the author English may not be her first language, right? So I, I go and I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I click on this link and I go and I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm kind of curious what somebody has to say, you know, how to bring more women into wargaming because the whole premise is I mean you know the wargaming hobby is dying uh, there's no getting around it right it's a, it, the graying of the hobby it's it's dying out and I will talk a little bit about that in just a moment so anyway so I get to this article and uh, the author's name is Aria really long last name uh, Polish or Czech or something like that so I don't want to butcher the name and I guess Aria has done some uh, she she works in the wargaming industry, doing graphic design, and uh, she, I believe she had a, an article in Ya Magazine from my friends over at Flying Pig Games, and uh, she's worked with uh, Ty Bamba and um, Joe Miranda, doing some graphic work for them. So I'm like, okay. So I read this article, and first of all, I'm like, okay. So it is the most clickbaity article that you will see because in the first paragraph it basically says well if we want to bring more women to the hobby you need to bring more people to the hobby yeah duh thanks and the whole, it's very very short article and the thing is not only is it clickbait it's also it also read as a very cut and paste kind of article the kind of kind of stuff you would see like in a sponsored post or a guest post somewhere. But this is her blog. This is Aria's blog. This behind the counter is her blog. And it shared absolutely nothing new. And it was just kind of talking about, you know, diversity and, oh, you know, as a man, if you're a war gamer, treat a woman at the game table like you would any other gamer. And just the same, same ridiculous nonsense that we've talked about for years. Forever. No solutions, right? It's just, oh, yeah. And, and the funny thing is, it put the onus on the gamer, the war gamer himself, because, of course, it's pointed at a male-dominated hobby. So it's putting the onus on the male war gamer, how, how you need to treat women. And, and I am not saying that you treat women any differently than any other gamer at your table. I welcome all different people <laughs> to, to my game table. Hey, if you're a cool gamer, that's great. That's what I like. I don't care about your sex or religion or color or sexual orientation or anything like that. And when I say don't care, I don't mean like, oh, yeah, whatever. It just means that that does not impact you being welcome to play games with me and the rest of my gaming gang. So I found it very interesting that the onus of how, how we can bring more people into the hobby, because that's how you get more women into the hobby, was that uh, mainly that the men in the hobby had to change our attitudes. 
that's sort of the gist I got. But as I mentioned, this was a very like cut and paste sort of article. And it was maybe like four paragraphs long. Like I said, really, I could tell. And in fact, I commented on this article, which of course the comment was under moderation. So I don't know if the comment will ever be posted to this uh, blog piece, blog posting or whatever. And I said, you know, this, this article tells us nothing new. This is something everybody's been talking about for years. And I said, this is just a kind of clickbait article. It's very cut and paste. And I would certainly welcome Arya's thoughts on working in the wargaming industry, their thoughts on her thoughts on, you know, gaming and all these other things. But it was sort of like, you know, this isn't from the heart. This is who I wonder how I can get more people to click on this because it's a brand new blog. There's only, I think, like four posts. And my comment, you know, basically summed up, hey, I'd love to hear more about your experiences, but how about, you know, writing from the heart, not writing because you're trying to get people to click on your article because that is not going to gain you followers. Somebody's going to read it and they're going to go, whatever. Wow. Oh, the sun is hot. Thanks for letting me know. So here's something that I wanted to float out there. If we really want to bring more women into the hobby, and like I said, this is going to piss people off and and it is going to piss off some specific game companies out there too. Once again, I don't care. If we want to bring more women to the hobby, if we want to bring younger gamers to the hobby, the onus is on the game companies and designers. The onus is not on the war gamer because you know what? The reality is the vast majority of us who play war games and conflict simulations are not weirdo Neanderthals, you know, pounding our chests or, oh, there's a girl at the table. I can't concentrate. No, that's bullshit. And everybody knows that's bullshit. I'm not saying there aren't, aren't scumbags and trolls and people who are socially awkward who play games who are men. But this whole premise of, oh, well, the onus is on, on the gamer themselves to bring people into the hobby. No, that is incorrect. The onus is on the game companies and designers. And the reason I mention this is because one of the reasons why wargaming is graying, wargaming is dying. I know plenty of different... Uh, Robert Moffat chimes in and says, I believe Guns of Gettysburg by Mercury Games... I'm guessing it's Mercury Games, uh, was designed by a woman. I believe it. There are a lot of games out there designed by women. There are a lot of women who play war games. Conflict simulations. I'll, and I'll give you an example. Oh, uh, one of the other things in this blog was, oh, you know, to get more women into the hobby, you need to support women who are involved in the hobby. And then they listed three different blogs, right? And one of them was... Uh, was Katie, I think her last name is Adley, Adley? Uh, she, do, she does uh, Katie's Board Game Corner. Who, Katie's cool. Katie, see, this was what kind of kind of made the whole, like, this is clickbait, this is guest post crap. Because it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's a sponsored post because, you know, you always have the, the links to different uh, sources and things like that. Katie does a phenomenal job. And I'm not saying Katie paid... <laughs> paid this woman to to write an article and include her. I'm just saying that she mentions board game, uh, Katie's board game corner. And Katie's phenomenal, right? Because Katie writes from the heart. She talks about, hey, these are my personal experience in the hobby, things like that. I, I don't think I've ever seen Katie post something about, yeah, you know, men are Neanderthals. So anyway, um, kind of jumped off a little bit. So I was going to say the way that we bring more people and of course more women into, into wargaming is these companies need to stop rehashing the same old shit over and over and over again. I had to laugh because uh, this Aria at behindthehex.com was talking about, well, she's done graphic work for Ty Bamba and Joe Miranda. Two designers who are still putting out the same dusty crap from the late 1970s and 1980s. And people need to, if you want to grow the wargaming hobby, conflict simulation hobby, 
You need to stop supporting companies like, oh, I don't know, Decision Games that publishes just crap, unplay-tested garbage, and it's just the same rehash over and over again. Imagine if you're a gamer out there and your wife, your girlfriend, whatever, when you first wanted to introduce them to possibly a war game, would you have sat down and said, okay, let me bust out this, this epic game that takes about eight hours to play with god-awful, just traditional NATO iconography on the counters, very blah map, and be like, yeah, baby, I'm introducing you to my hobby. You probably wouldn't be dating them or married to them if that was the case. My gosh. And it's funny because I would see when I went to Con Sim World Expo, I would see some little small companies. Yeah, and they were along the lines of, you know, kind of almost like uh, self-published stuff. And it was, it was the same junk. It was like, yes, look, look at the great black and white map. And oh, yes. The British are brown counters. Oh, and the Germans are gray counters. Wow, that is so unique. You're blowing my mind. No, that is not going to bring people in. And yes, I know there are plenty of grognards out there who love really meaty and very intricate designs. And that's great. That is fine. Don't expect people who do not play conflict simulations to find any appeal to, wow, I need to know the, uh, the penetration value of that Panzer, uh, of that, uh, let's say, of that 88 uh, hitting the left armor of a Sherman's turret. No, people don't care about that. And that's one of the things that uh, a lot of war gamers need to wake up to is that, yes, Board gaming in itself, tabletop gaming in itself, is a very small hobby. It's a very niche hobby. I know they, they, people don't like to hear that, but it's true. It is, comic books are way larger. That hobby is way larger than tabletop gaming. And that's also a small niche hobby. Not everyone's out there buying comics at their friendly local comic store. So the onus is on companies to create unique designs because that's like i said that's what i see a lot of and i know war game designers and i'm not talking about herman lutman okay because herman lutman my good pal uh i don't know if he wants his common knowledge or not but i will float this out there because he just did uh i just did the unboxing for uh at any cost mets 1870 it is a war game but he, as a gamer, is actually shifting away from playing a lot of war games. And as a designer, he's kind of shifting away from war games just because he wants something different. He wants something unique. The war gaming companies out there, the companies that really focus strongly on war games, many of them are not adapting. They just assume, well, you know, if I throw a little chrome on this design, well, then people will buy it. And it, that's not the case. Now, there are exceptions, of course. There's companies like GMT Games. Or there's companies like Flying Pig Games. They are making different well, Victory Point games, too. I'll throw Victory Point games in. And if I'm, like, leaving out, say, like a company like Hollenspiel or, uh, like, Worthington, things like that, or even Columbia, I don't see a whole lot of stuff coming from Columbia too much. They seem to be more focused on their Hearn RPG. Or maybe I'm just not getting news pieces. Maybe that's it. But uh, I'm, I, I don't mean to leave them out because they have done some unique stuff too. I just haven't played enough to really comment. But when you've got companies out there, and I, I'm sorry, I'm beating up on decision games. But when you have companies that just, it's the same crap that we have seen for decades in this hobby, how can you imagine anybody wanting to get into it? So... To bring more people into wargaming in the conflict simulation, we have to come up with unique designs. Oh, and I, I was starting to say when I got off topic with Herman Lettman, there are many wargame designers out there who effectively just steal other elements from other designs. I have found from my personal experience, and, you know, Joe Miranda is a nice guy. I've met Joe 
very sweet guy, but can anybody claim that any of his designs over, I don't know, the last 15 years have broken the mold of anything? No. And that is not going to bring people in. Just throwing out the same old hex and counter look, the same little counters, the same NATO iconography, the same boring looking maps, that is not going to bring anybody to the table either. So wargaming companies, big and small, have to start thinking, okay, how are we going to survive? Because I, I can tell you there are not, there's not enough new blood coming into the hobby to replace the blood that is flowing out of the hobby. And I love war games, don't get me wrong. But you couldn't pay me to play a decision game. There's no way. It's, they're, it's garbage. They're broken. First of all, they're broken designs. And I'm sorry to pick on them, but they are a prime example of how you're never going to grow this hobby. And this hobby will continue to shrink and shrink and shrink. It's companies like GMT, Flying Pig Games, Victory Point Games that are actually changing stuff up. It's designers like Herman Wettman <clears throat> and Mark H. Walker. And Mark H. Walker has a lot of traditional uh, kind of aspects and mechanics to his game designs, but there's also fresh stuff in there too. Devil Pig Games with their Heroes of Normandy is a great fresh new game, says Rob. I didn't care for Heroes of Normandy. Sorry, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta be honest. I, th I to me it was way too light. Now, does it make a pretty good introduction to the hobby? Sure. And you can use other games to introduce people into conflict simulation. Look at 1960 from GMT Games, right? Okay. Hey, that's kind of interesting, right? You're looking at, oh, it's Kennedy versus Nixon, the election. Maybe maybe your spouse, girlfriend, who, whoever is uh, kind of a political junkie. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know what? You should really check this out. Uh, let me break my copy out and we'll play. Well, guess what? Now you've just introduced them to a card-driven game, which can easily segue into, say, Twilight Struggle, which can segue into Washington's War. Have to, you know, you have to be smart about this. So anyway, so yeah, I just wanted to point out that the onus is not on the gamers, right? I do not sit at a gaming table with, with women at the table and act any differently or less respectful or less funny or whatever than I would if they weren't at the table. I, I, I don't dig the whole, it's, it's the war gamers problem why we don't have more young people and more women and more diverse people enjoying war gaming and conflict simulation. Small percentage of war gamers out there are, I guess I'll say dicks. The vast majority are just regular people who play, you know, might be playing a war game one day and then the next day or next time they get together with friends, they're playing Smash Up or Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. The onus is not on the war gamer. The onus is on the publishers and designers to create games that will appeal to a more diverse crowd as opposed to the 70 year old guy who likes to sit there with his tweezers moving stacks of counters for hours at a time. All right, so anyway, that was uh, that was my opinion piece. And like I said, yeah, I'm sure some people aren't going to dig that, aren't going to dig the, that I'm saying that the problem isn't a war gamer, the problem is the war gaming companies, why this, this industry is shrinking even further. So now that I've got that out of my system, now I can take a look at a war gaming expansion. <sighs> Way to go, Jeff! Yeah! Hey, I didn't say anything bad about GMT Games because everybody knows I love the folks over at GMT. I like a vast majority of the people that I know in the, in the gaming industry. And after Gamma, after the Gamma trade show, you're going to start uh, seeing more of my friends in the industry because I am going to have a lot of interviews, not all on top of each other, but I am going to have quite a few interviews because I want to kind of break it up a little bit. I don't want to every day be unboxing something or reviewing something, and you're only just watching my mug every day. I want to get, uh, I want to get some, uh, hey, I want to get some fresh blood. 
just like the wargaming industry, right? I need some fresh blood. Oh, the last thing before I jump into uh, the unboxing is, uh, what was it, Monday's show? Or maybe last week I was like, wow, convention season's right around the corner. Convention season for me is going to start in April. And then I realized, oh, wait, no. Convention season's actually starting earlier than that because I will be covering Adepticon next weekend. And next weekend is still March. Ugh, I don't know. I'm scared. I, I'll be honest. I'm scared because uh, I don't see how I'm going to be able to, to tackle uh, the various different conventions this year. I really don't. It's it's cash, folks. Uh, I think people kind of realize I'm doing this show Monday through Friday. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, I'm not doing this show just because it's like, oh, I got time before I got to go to work. So anyway, I might talk a little bit about that tomorrow. All right, so come on, enough of me rambling on. I'm going to take a look at MBT FRG for main battle tank from my good pals over at GMT Games. Let's uh, swing over to the other camera. Yay, there we go. So if you watched on Monday, uh, oh, and before I jump in, Robert Moffat said, ooh, Washington's War, good stuff there. Uh, we loved it when it was We the People. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I liked Washington's War better. I think it was uh, had a little more polish. You know what? Uh, I should mention one, um, one card-driven Mark Herman game that I've never had an opportunity to actually play is uh, Empire of the Sun. It really, really looks like it would, it would be, it would scratch all these different itches that I have. Kind of a meteor card-driven war game. Only thing is that it kind of scares some folks off because it does look a lot like a traditional war game. All righty. So I've got main battle tank. This is a new expansion. I was going to say, uh, Caught the show on Monday. I did the British Army of the Rhine expansion for MBT. This is the second expansion that's uh, available right now. It is designed by James M. Day. It does carry an MSRP over on GMT Games of $65. And uh, I know or Robert's kicking it. He's got the day off from work today, so he's watching the show. So if... Uh, if Mrs. Robert or Mrs. Rob happens to see this video, uh, I apologize. I understand Rob has sent me some emails and commented on some videos saying, wow, you should get commissioned <laughs> on these war games because I bought something like four war games after watching the Daily Dope. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. It's This is just my show, okay? I'm just a messenger. <laughs> Don't. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're watching that Jeff character again? Uh. All right, it's moving right along. Hey, it's a live show. That's what happens, a live show. I get to kick back, relax. Piss off the decision games apologists out there. Yeah, you know, that's what I do. Okay, so got that opened up. And let's take a quick uh, look at the back. And of course, it is an expansion. You do, do need main battle tank to play. It says, FRG expands the NATO forces, focusing on the West German Army of 1987. Included are the Leopard 1, two models, Leopard 2, two models, uh, Martyr, Jaguar 1, Jaguar 2, Lukes, not familiar with those, what those are, Japard PAHA 1A1 uh, attack helicopters, tornado IDS aircraft, and a number of other units, including infantry and their various anti tank weapons. All right, so what unique map boards do we have? We have an urban area, an airfield, and a supply depot. Because in the uh, British Army of the Rhine, we had a speedway, a tank farm, and uh, power plant. So those are cool. Hey, Russell's chiming in. <laughs> hey, Russell, how are you? Hide the wallets. Okay, you can hide the wallet. 
Oh, I should also point out real quick, if you watch the show on YouTube after the stream, after it's been rendered in chat, chat does pop up on the side. So, uh, so people can actually see, I'm not making these people up. I'm not pulling people just, you know, off the top of my head and, oh, Leslie in Spokane says, no, see that they're real people. All right, so, and uh, main battle tank is a six complexity as well as solitaire suitability, according to GMT games on their scale of one to nine. All right, let's see what we've got. So I'm sure this is gonna be very similar to what we saw as far as the British Army of the Rhine. So we're gonna have some maps, we have some new unit cards, we're gonna have some new counters. We'll have the playbook with new scenarios. And if memory serves me correctly, I think, I think there were 10 scenarios. Hey, there's a, there's a 10 sided die. I'm trying to remember if when I opened up the British Army of the Rhine expansion, I'm trying to remember if there was actually a die in the bag. And remember it says it includes a 10 sided die and I didn't remember seeing it. But then again, what I usually do, you know, I just took this, these items out of this bag and I just kind of tossed the bag off to the side. I wonder if that's where the die was. So we do know this one, <laughs> this expansion has a 10 sided die. Okay, so we'll look at the maps in just a bit. We'll look at the counters in just a bit. Let's get these unit cards open up. And as I mentioned with uh, the previous expansion unboxing, main battle tank really does focus armor on armor. That is the focus of the game. Uh, granted, there are infantry, there are special weapons, crew weapons, things like that. But the big focus is on, is pretty much tank on tank action. So, oh, uh, we've got Alex... I'm sorry, it's A-L-X-Y-T. Hey man, love your videos. How's it going? Pretty good. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, the kudos there. I am in the midst of the unboxing for uh, FRG, the expansion for main battle tanks. Ah, let's look at the playbook first. So we've got an introduction. It's talking about some of the new units, the TO and E's. Terrain features, arming and refueling. Ah, okay, so the supply depot, controlling objectives, the counters, talking about leader, um, uh, leader employment, leader effects. Very similar to the other expansion, the BAOR expansion, command, morale. Okay, so now it's going to start talking about the West German units and Soviet units. Don't recall, uh, I don't believe we had, oh yeah, we did have some Soviet units, Soviet counters. So, uh, Robert's wife said, if I keep ordering games after watching your show, she's driving to Chicago to find your house and shutting off my electricity. Well, she can search all she wants in the city of Chicago. Said so Chicago area is where I live. I grew up, uh, born and raised northwest side of Chicago. That's why I'm a Cubs fan. All right, so got some U.S. troops. Got organizational charts here. Giving a summary of the units here. Got a summary of the Soviet units. All right, and then we move into scenarios. First moves, part one. First moves, part two. This is going to show you the units available to you. We've got over the hill and dale. Ah, southern border of Czechoslovakia. It was not known as the Czech Republic yet. All right, so then we've got uh, 
the force is there. Another scenario here, lightning strike. I got brothers in arms. Cityscape, this must be where we use that urban map that we'll take a look at in just a sec. So of course it's got the uh, situations, special conditions, the setup for the scenario, victory conditions of the scenario. I I play uh, I really dug Panzer when I played Panzer. But oh gosh, that's quite a long time ago. Uh, yeah. So, uh, been close several times pulling the trigger on Panzer. Mm, all depends on what you're looking for. If you're if you're really looking for that armor on armor experience, mm, yeah, then I would say definitely. If I remember correctly, and it's been a long time since I played, I seem to recall that uh, Panzer was a little light as far as infantry rules. Now we're talking the base game. I'm not talking the expansions that came along, but uh, the base game itself. Because uh, people are different. Because I know there are a lot of people out there who are huge fans of like Advanced Squad Leader, and Advanced Squad Leader really does get into the whole you know infantry aspects, and not so doesn't do as well with uh, the armor. Whereas I, I look at Panzer as kind of the opposite of that. If memory serves me correctly. So what do we have? What do we have? Ten scenarios? Let's see. Yep. Ten scenarios in the playbook. So we've got that. Okay, and then we'll look at the units. And these are dual-sided, nice and thick. Nice and thick here. Just take a quick look here. And of course, you're looking at the offensive information and then defensive information for the units. Pretty cool. So it looks like we've got, looks like everything's West German so far. So we got artillery batteries. We got the Leopard. Yep. So these are the two models of the Leopard. we've got squads so there's some infantry info here yep crew served weapons here cool I remembered ah there had to be one for the Brits in the other expansion there's got to be all right Jaguar both models of that ah here's a tornado Martyr. Is this an APC? I, I'm, I'm the first one to, to point out that I am probably not as uh, well educated as I could be as far as uh, like the 80s, which is funny because I played a bunch of stuff like Warsaw Pact, things like that back in the 80s. But it's just, you know, the, the different uh, units and armor various tanks things like that just uh just doesn't stick so for me i'm sort of like oh yeah the abrams yeah okay got the got the abrams <laughs> it's like okay all right look at this we got a little conversation going everybody's talking about uh various different games very cool nice Oh, I should ask while I'm taking a peek at this, since I've got quite a few. It looks like I've got four Wargamers kind of chatting right now. Um, how do you guys like the new, uh, kind of new design of Com... Com... Sim uh, how about speaking English, Jeff? Con Sim World. Because uh, I have to admit, John over at Con Sim World is really nice. Really, really nice guy. And it was nice to see them try to 
because I, you know, I don't hang out there too much because I always found the forums to be kind of a mess. And the funny thing is, I know my wargaming videos would get way more views if I actually um, did like post stuff on the forum and things like that. But uh, I don't know. But uh, I do like some of the changes because eh, that was not not the prettiest website around. Then again, I'll be the first to say that Board Game Geek isn't a very pretty website either. All right, so here we go with the counter sheets. Looks like we've got three once again. A nice close-up look here. These are dual-sided. So there are plenty, plenty of units here. So, Rob, I know you're watching uh, as I'm showing these off. I should ask, did you get a chance to uh, get Old School Tactical to the table yet? Yeah, like the Consim World has a new design? Uh, sort of. Yes, I couldn't follow the stuff with it being on one long thread. Yeah, you, uh, that's that, that's like my big knock on Consim World, because it's just all... It doesn't, it's not even laid out like a, a regular forum that you see. It's like really old design, really, really old content management, uh, a content management system being utilized on it. So, still a pretty good source, just hard to track stuff down. I actually use uh, Feedly, feedly.com, and uh, I actually subscribe to Consim World, and that's how a lot of times I'll run across some wargaming information, wargaming news. That's actually how I found that uh, that blog post about how to bring more women into wargaming. All right, so there we go. Yeah, we got some more Soviet units here. Nice. I know I'm supposed to be doing an unboxing and I'm kind of chatting with you guys. Hey, that's that's a it's a live show. That's one of the benefits of doing a live show is we can kind of, you know, take it easy, kind of chat about stuff. All right, so we got the different informational markers here. We've got the leaders. Ah, I kind of kind of glossed over this one. So we've got the leaders here. We've got the aircraft. We've got the turret counters. More infantry. And victory point markers. All right, so let's take a look at these maps. Do we have four? Yep, we got four. So there were four in the uh, BAOR expansion, too. So that's eight new maps. Let's see what we've got. And these are dual sided. Ta da! Okay, so here, this is the urban area. So this is a new urban area map. Nice, uh, nice lake right there. With a highway right across the lake. Pond? Nah, it's probably a lake. All right. Uh, got a town here. So that's the first one. All right. So, uh, looks like an airfield to me. It's upside down. It does look like an airfield. So this is map 14. And just a uh, hill there. Oh, no, didn't look at the back. Oh, looks like forested area. All right, haven't gotten OSC to the table yet. Very soon. So Russell says the size of the map really put me off on old school tactical. That was actually a comment that I made in my review. I would have liked that if. Um, uh, Mark H. Walker and Flying Pig Games had actually broken up into a modular map, and then you would have a lot more flexibility with the map itself. And yeah, it is a huge map. It is a really big map. So, pretty interesting, though, that uh, some folks didn't purchase Old School Tactical based on the map size. Because when you're uh, learning the game, you're not playing across the entire map. You're just playing in a sector of the map board. So 
really, it should have been just modular, and then you could just take, you know, just like uh, Nam 65. Nam 65, those maps are modular. So I was kind of surprised. All right, so we got the last map here. Kind of an open area, open fields. Got another urban area here, too. All right, very cool. What's on the back, back of this one? Hmm. All right. So we've got the four maps. Let's just take everything out before I put it back in. So we've got the four different maps. We've got the three counter sheets. We've got the playbook with the 10 scenarios as well as special rules for the West Germans. All the new units. So we got those cards there and the 10 sided die and baggy. There we go. There goes a 10, 10 sider. And that is what we find when we take everything from MBT FRG outside the box so as i mentioned before the uh frg expansion for main battle tank is available now it does carry an msrp of 65 dollars and i always toss these things out there when i talk about gmt games if you are interested in any of the gmt stuff i talk about i point out you want to grab them while you can because you don't want to end up having to get stuck trying to pick stuff up on the secondary market. It's not fun. And GMT does decent sized print runs, but we're not talking thousands of units. Usually their print runs are around a thousand, maybe a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So I always point out, snag them while you can. So, all right. So that is it for the show. Looks like we got... Uh, Folks having a good time chatting in chat, which I like to see. <laughs> it's sort of like, there are some times when I do shows where it's like, eh, nobody's chatty today, which is okay. Uh, FRG is actually the West German forces. I honestly do not know exactly what FRG stands for. I don't even think it says on the box. Mm, nope, doesn't say. But uh, I believe FRG was the abbreviation for West German forces in, um, in Western Europe, the NATO forces. So I don't know. I uh, honestly do not know. I, do, I did know that BAOR stood for British Army of the Rhine, but yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Once again, I am uh, not the uh, most well-versed person in 1980s. <laughs> Even though I lived through it, yeah, I was in high school, so... Uh, Federal Republic of Germany. Thank you, Russell. Thank you for pointing that out. Does make sense, doesn't it? All right, so if you're curious what's uh, going on for the rest of the week, I have... Tomorrow I'm going to do a review, because yes, I did get a chance to read this. And yes, I know my wargaming friends out there are probably like, okay, well, I won't be watching tomorrow, but I'm going to review Amazing Tales which is a game for children who love adventures. It is an RPG game. It is aimed for very young children. So uh, it is, eh, I'm not going to spoil anything from the review, but what it, what it really does focus on is, is smaller children, like four and five years old, who you would not normally think you would be running a role-playing game for. But it's really uh, very interesting because it's kind of like, you know, you can run a role-playing game at bedtime, Instead of reading him a story, you're actually doing uh, a role-playing game when it's just, you know, you and your child or you and your kids just kind of hunkered down on the couch relaxing. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff. So I'm going to review this on tomorrow's show. And then on Friday, it is Family Fun Friday, uh, as far as I know, because stuff uh, arrives in the mail, and I'm like, uh, okay, wow, I should really get that out pretty quick. Like the Thanos Rising I did yesterday for uh, from USAopoly. That just showed up the day before. And it's not out yet in stores, so I wanted to show it off. I'm going to get it reviewed before it goes out in stores, too. Just because uh, when I have an opportunity to give you the heads up on something that's coming, 
whether it's good or bad, give you a heads up before it arrives. I like to do that. But anyway, as far as I know, I will actually finally review Epic Card Game from White Wizard Games on Friday. Worst case scenario, if something like really super exciting pops up, uh, I will make sure that I do a review on Monday for this. All right, so there you have it. All right, gents. So we've got we've got Russell, we got Robert, we've got. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how the name would be pronounced. <laughs> it looks French. Hey, everybody knows English is kind of a second language to me even though it is my first language. Anyway, so I believe we had four folks floating around in chat today. So thank you so much for swinging by to catch the show. If you watch the show regularly, allow me to ask a favor. If you do watch regularly, could you give a thumbs up to the video? <laughs> You know, uh, I, which it, I, I shouldn't really say anything because I have seen some videos out there that have like thousands and thousands of views and they'll have like three thumbs up. So it's true. That's how I thought it would be pronounced, but I wasn't positive. So yes, we had Robert, we have Russ, we got Drew. All right. So uh, actually the reason why I was saying I'm not really sure about the pronunciation is because Drew's name wasn't actually showing up on my chat screen. It already moved off. <laughs> so... What can I tell you? All right, Robert says, great show. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rob. I believe it's Rob. It's like, I'm, uh, I'm Jeff. Don't call me Jeffrey. Only my mom calls me that. Anyway, as I was saying, if you like the show, give it a thumbs up. If you aren't a subscriber, please subscribe. And of course, when you are not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to go visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, you know the drill by now. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. I am actually going to have later, I think it'll be up this weekend uh, because convention season is coming. I am going to kind of revamp my 10 helpful tips for convention attendance, which were kind of funny. Uh, it's been a few years since I did that post, so I, I'm going to kind of revamp that. Anyway, I will be back tomorrow with a review for Amazing Tales. So until then, be sure to enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. It's hump day. We're getting over the hump. Weekend's not that far off. I'm Jeff McAleer. So until tomorrow, thanks for watching. <laughs>